Alongside Dave McCann, I am Spencer Linton. Great to have you with us on BYU Sports Nation. Speaking of 1983 BYU football, the starting center of every game in that season, ESPN College Football Insider and five out of five stars, BYUSN contributor Trevor Maddich joins us to hang out in the summer. Hope your summer season's going well, Trevor. Welcome back to the program. Thank you, Spencer. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, every I, I played, I started every game that year splitting time with Robert and I. Uh, he played the second and fourth quarter of every game. And, of course, now you know, he went on to be an offensive coordinator here and then at Virginia, now at Syracuse. And so Robert and I has turned into a brilliant football mind. And so he was there sharing that position with me. Have we asked Trevor the question of who's better, 83 or 84, since you played on both teams? Well, we can go there again right now, Trevor, if you'd like to um, make a statement and take a stance on that. That's a tough one. It's a really tough one. <laughs> but I think 84 was probably the best team mm. uh, overall. Well, you you can point to positions. So. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can point to positions where 83 was better. But I think overall as a team, the way that the 84 team came together as a unit with that win over Pitt to open the season with the Kyle Morrell miraculous <laughs> stop on the goal line at Hawaii and all the things that drove us together, I think a team as a whole – You'd have to give the edge to 84. Did that win you over? Or are you just going to hold steady it's, at 84? It's hard to argue with Trevor Maddich. It, all, it always <laughs> is. So now I'm waffling. Thanks, Trevor. I'm waffling on my hill. Uh, speaking of waffling, college football in general and the Power Five as we know it is floating out there in the wind somewhere. Uh, what's next for college football in your opinion? And, again, this idea that we've grown accustomed to of a Power Five. Well, what's next is unknown, although I think we can throw away the concept of incremental change at this point, because the, the SEC absorbing Oklahoma and Texas was, was huge. But this move of USC and UCLA to the Big Ten has the potential to be that complete destruction of the paradigm that we know and the rebuilding of a new paradigm. And this is what people need to watch for to see if that actually occurs. They need to watch for whether or not an expanded Big Ten and SEC hold their own playoff. In other words, have an NFC and AFC style two or three round playoff to determine the conference championships, then have their version of the Super Bowl, call it the national championship, which it most years would probably be, mm. and then exclude everybody else from that. Only those two conferences are involved. If they then collectively bargain with the players because you couldn't really have a collective bargaining agreement with 130 teams because they're disparate resources and commitment and needs and things like that. Uh, but if they have these two super conferences and they do that, uh, they'll be able to have a much more even playing field that they would then be able to collectively bargain either as a, a union of employees or as a trade association of independent contractors as the players now. And that would likely also include not just NIL, but also uh, very possibly revenue sharing as well. So if they could have a commissioner, if all those things happen, they would be then creating a top tier of college football, a top division. And then there's everybody else that they left behind. If that happens, then because of access to the national championship and all the rest of it, there will be a massive disruption that goes way beyond just conference realignment. Mm. However, if they decide to not go that route, if they decide to be the, the top two super conferences, but then still have a 12-team playoff, still include everybody in the FBS and all that, then the biggest change for most fans will be a different conference logo on some jerseys and a shakeup of scheduling. So the thing to watch for is, do those two conferences make their own national championship playoff that excludes everybody else? And they might do it, but we don't know yet. What seems odd to me, though, Trevor, in that scenario is, in those two big conferences, you shave off the upper six teams or seven or eight maybe uh, from those groups. You've got the elite teams. But the, the teams below them are subpar at best and nowhere near their level. So how can they put these two leagues together and say, we are now the best, most important 40 teams in the country when 20 of those teams aren't even close to the other 20 that are in the upper half of the leagues? They have a lot of people – would be asking that question. And I think their response would be, look at who's been in the playoffs since its inception and look who's won most of the national championships. And it's essentially been Ohio State in the first year of the playoff, I believe. And then the SEC and Clemson. And that's been about it. 
Uh, and so they would say that, yeah, it's, it's the upper tier that matters anyway. And then what they would then do is point you to other teams around the country and say, which of these teams have actually been a threat to win the national championship in the playoff era? So that's what they would say. Uh, is that is that fair? Is it right? I don't think fair and right are part of the issue right now. Nick Saban, Alabama's coach, has talked for years about the need to make sure that college football as a whole at the top takes care of college football at the bottom so that the the whole entity works well. But what we've seen with this conference realignment from individual teams and from conferences is that, okay, that didn't work out so well. We're going to do what's best for our self-interest and let the, let the chips fall where they may. And so that's where we are now. So whether or not something is good for all of college football right now, I don't think is, is the, the primary focus. I think it's what do I need to do as an individual program and conference to make sure I don't get left behind. Great stuff from Trevor Maddich, ESPN College Football Insider. Trevor, it is clearly, at least from what we can tell, now a race to become the third best conference. It feels that way anyway. And the Big 12, according to Pete Thamel of ESPN, one of your colleagues and compatriots, he says they're in the best position to become the third most powerful conference. But that can change very quickly. What does the Big 12 need to do to become that third most powerful conference behind the Big 10 and the SEC? I don't think they need to do a whole lot different. If you talk about conference from top to bottom, I mean, the the four teams that they brought in to replace Texas and Oklahoma are are not just sleeping giants. I mean, they're they're awake and they're stirring. You know, Cincinnati made the playoff last year. UCF beats SEC schools from time to time. Houston is one of the most storied and successful athletic programs top to bottom in all of college sports. And all of these programs are committed fully to maximizing their opportunities, not just with football, but with all athletics. And so you've got four programs that come in that bring in recruiting footprints that are are critical. In BYU's case, it's a national footprint and even international footprint. And so I think right now, the Big 12 did about as good as you could possibly hope for to, to move forward from the departure of Texas and Oklahoma. Now, if the Big 12 is able to to lure some of the other Pac-12 schools there, that would further solidify it. Then what they need to do is make sure that at the top, they're competing with the likes of Clemson. Because again, the college football world looks at who's your best team, who's your national championship contender. And so the Big 12, in order to really solidify themselves uh, as that next league, would need to have a team or two or three actually compete for a national championship the way that Clemson has competed for those national championships. All right, let's say you're the commissioner of the Big 12, and in the next five seconds you've got to decide which four teams you want to invite from the Pac-12 that you think you can get. Who are they? Well, it's that you think you can get is important, and timing is important. I think what we've learned with this whole process is that it doesn't pay to sit back and wait for things to happen and see what the best scenario is. You've got to jump because you don't know what other teams are thinking. I mean, nobody knew that Texas and Oklahoma were talking to the SEC until all of a sudden, bang, it happened. And in with USC and UCLA, it just shocked everybody. I mean, I don't know how you keep things like that secret, uh, but they were able to keep it secret. So now if other programs, say in the Pac-12 as an example, say, yeah, no, we're, we're committed here to the Pac-12. We're not going anywhere. Based on recent history, can you afford to trust them? For example, um, you know, the, there's talk that if Notre Dame, uh, whatever Notre Dame does, the Big Ten might continue to expand out into the Pac-12. You know, Washington and Oregon are members of the American um, uh, Association of American Universities, AU, so they fit academically. Same way with Cal and Stanford, same way with Utah, by the way. And so, you know, if, if everybody says we're committed to the Pac-12, but behind the scenes, Washington and Oregon are about to take off. What would that do if you lost an opportunity to then go to the Big 12 because you believe what they said? Now, I'm not sure. I'm not saying that anybody is being dishonest. I'm just saying in this climate, how do you trust what anybody's doing? So right now, the Big 12 is it's reported that they are talking to the Arizona schools, Utah and Colorado. Utah has come out and vehemently denied that. Utah has has publicly reiterated their commitment to the Pac-12. But if you if you move away from the individual schools and just look at the climate, I would think that if if Pac-12 schools that don't have a firm, you know, indication from the Big 10 that they're going to take them at some point, 
then if you get an offer from the Big 12, it would be kind of hard to not go. It's not because the Pac-10 now would not be a viable league. It would be with Washington, Oregon, uh, Stanford, uh, Utah. It would be a viable league. Sure. What you can't trust, though, is that all four of those schools and the rest of them are going to stay. You don't know that. So when the opportunity arises, you may see people go. So right now, the Big 12, the ones that they are are reported to be looking at, Arizona schools, Colorado and Utah, would be terrific additions. Trevor Maddich of ESPN is on BYU Sports Nation. This feels almost harsh to ask, Trevor, but is it in the best interest of the Big 12 to poach from the Pac-12 and essentially wipe out the Pac-12? Well, you know how... uh, is it in your best interest to, to not steal a loaf of bread from the store? Most of the time, yeah. But if your kids are starving, then you got to do what you got to do, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not suggesting theft. I think maybe it would be better to go in and wash the windows or something like that. But <laughs> uh, for the loaf of bread. But how hungry you are is, is what matters the most. And so, you know, would it be in the best interest of the Big 12 to poach? My thought is absolutely. The Big 12 was the the – the least stable conference teetering on the edge of oblivion for the last several years. Wow. All of a sudden, uh, we were well, crazy. But now with the addition of the four new teams and with the possibility of bringing in some of the Pac-12 schools, it looks quite stable. And if I'm the Big 12, uh, I would be very tempted to do everything I can to further that stability, regardless of who gets mad at me. Because right now, the SEC and the Big 10 have both set the stage they've set the paradigm we're in the age of poaching so it almost seems like if you don't at least try you're not doing your job well enough i think one thing we're seeing is this aura of that there's just so much money for all of these conferences uh, that no matter what they do at like a, a billion dollars in the big 10 and a billion dollars in the sec and and a bunch of money all over the place Where's all this coming from? And outside of your contract with ESPN, how does ESPN afford all this? Uh, And are they just going to raise the subscription rate so we're actually the ones who are financing the operation for all these schools? Well, broadcasting is in transition as well. And one thing that we haven't seen yet is what it might look like if multiple streaming companies come in and start to compete. When you, you know, Amazon's already kind of dipped their foot in the water by getting the NFL Thursday night package. But when you look at the streaming, pack, you look at, at, at Amazon Prime and Disney Plus, Netflix, Peacock, Discovery Plus, all these different things, what they, what they offer is fantastic original content and fantastic older content that you can binge watch it all. Live sports is the one thing that you can't binge watch. You have to be there. And if one of these streaming platforms can be the platform of live college football because they outbid everybody else it gives them i believe a a huge advantage in the market we haven't seen what will happen if that kind of bidding war starts to happen now espn connected with disney plus and so i'm not sure exactly how that would work out either i would say that's a pretty big advantage but at the same time that's one of the reasons that i don't believe that you're going to have too much trouble with the schools that are not in the big 10 and the sec if you compare those schools and their income and the rest of it to the two super conferences, well, they're going to be wanting. But because this this expansion doesn't change the number of games available, really, for the inventory for broadcasters, you know, there's still a number of broadcast windows. They're still filled up with, the, you know, a number of games, and that's what it is. ESPN on Tuesday and Wednesday nights in October and November run Mac games. And they get great ratings because people love it. So the question is, who else is going to jump in and start to bid for these things? Because the rights are going up like crazy. But the reason the rights are going up is because the value is going up. Trevor, in your very educated college football mind, full of logic and full of experience in realignment, do you feel like, based on what the Pac-12 is saying, trying to negotiate a new TV rights deal in the next 30 days with ESPN and Fox and with these schools, Utah, Arizona State, specifically saying, hey, we're tethered together with the Pac-12. Are you buying that the Pac-12 will still exist in three years from now, or do you think we are witnessing the demise of one of the all-time great conference of champions? Right now, the way it looks, I think the Pac-12 will survive. But I think competitively on the field, they will have to overcome the loss of the L.A. market. 
the recruiting story over the last several years out west has always been how, how many top California recruits are leaving the state. So the Heisman Trophy winner last year, Bryce Young of Alabama, quarterback, is a California guy, C.J. Stroud, the quarterback for Ohio State, who's going to be a Heisman candidate this year. Uh, California guy, D.J. Uyunglele, quarterback out of California, one of the top recruits when he came out, is at Clemson right now. Um, Kayvon Thibodeau, uh, the top recruit in the nation, coming out as a defensive lineman, left California and went to Oregon. Well, now that USC and UCLA are part of the Big Ten, now that there's going to be so much excitement there and so much money, California recruits have even more reason to now stay home. And if they do, USC especially, but also UCLA are going to rise to become national powers. Well, if they do stay home, those guys that would have gone to Oregon, to Washington, to, to Utah and BYU, to other places, more of them will stay home. And that will affect the rest of the Pac-12 in terms of their ability to compete on a national level. Mm. Heavy stuff, great stuff from ESPN's Trevor Maddich. Always great to catch up with you, and uh, we should have mentioned this off the top. The beard still looks great. It's hanging on to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we think that's yeah. a good decision it's for you in your life. more of a Tom Selleck mustache, though. It's kind of overshadowing <laughs> the rest of the beard. Uh, so, well, so you say I should keep it for the season because this – No, I'm we're not saying that. She's the owner-operator of the beard. We are not you know? saying that. We're just saying that today, you know, it, I think it looks, it looks good. good. And it looks I, good. You're right. Your wife's opinion matters most. That That is what matters most. Just go with her on yeah. that one. She likes it. Well, it covers half my face. I think that's, that's <laughs> half the battle right there. <laughs> Trevor, thanks so much. We'll talk to you again soon. Great to see you. Thanks, guys. Trevor thanks.